first decade for the American motorcycle was nothing short of sensational. Hundreds of manufacturers rolled thousands of machines out of their factories, each more capable than the one before. In a time when automobiles were still prohibitively expensive, motorcycles offered people of every status an urbane and practical mode of transportation. Local motorcycle clubs sprung up across the country, as did numerous trade publications describing the widening spectrum of motorcycling life. As an exhilarating offshoot of the fashionable bicycle racing circuit of years past, racing motorcycles had become one of the most popular sports in the country. Once competition ascended to the national level, the first racing stars emerged simultaneously with the first factory racing teams. Dirt horse tracks remained an accessible venue for racers and spectators alike, but hill climbs and multi-day endurance runs allowed manufacturers a chance to truly test their machines. In the cycling world, motorcycle exhibitions became a popular featured event on the small, eighth-of-a-mile wooden velodromes peppered across the country. Still, the machines had quickly grown too powerful for the bicycle velodromes. If the sport were to grow, a new venue would have to be built. With the velodrome as a blueprint, a new type of venue emerged that would take the country by storm, the American Motordrome. Do you enjoy videos like these? Consider supporting the project by joining the Archive Moto Patreon community. The Board Track Motodrome, bygone cathedrals of frenzied triumph and recurrent tragedy, produced a new breed of professional. The Board Track racers were a unique class restless gentlemen of a new century who put their lives on the line to the delight of the crowd. The brainchild of British high-wheeled cycle champion and velodrome pioneer John Shillington Prince, dozens of his new wooden motodromes were constructed across America between 1909 and 1914. The first of which, the Los Angeles Coliseum, opened in March 1909 to sensation and acclaim. Within months, the best motorcycle racers in America had arrived in Southern California to prove their mettle. Prince's grand experiment, the Los Angeles Coliseum, was a two-seventh of a mile wooden oval with 48-degree banking on each end. Aside from a few early scaled-up velodrome tracks, like the one in Clifton, New Jersey, the Los Angeles Coliseum was America's first motodrome. Like his velodromes, Prince's first motodrome was not circular, but rather an oval shape featuring flatter straights and banked corners. But despite being sized up for motorcycles, the bicycle velodrome design did not translate as well as Prince had hoped, and riders complained that it was difficult to hit top speed given the transition in banking. The first practice session at the newly completed Los Angeles Coliseum was held in late February 1909, and riders like Morty Graves and Arthur Mitchell hit unofficial record speeds upwards of 75 miles per hour. Racing pioneers Paul Durkham, Jake DeRozier, Fred Height, and Charlie Balk watched from the pits as new possibilities opened up in front of their eyes, hungry to get their own time on the boards. On March 14, 1909, the Los Angeles Coliseum opened its gates to the public with over 5,000 enthusiasts gathered to take in the spectacle. Indians Jacob DeRozier, America's first professional motorcycle racer, demolished the field, setting new records at distances of one, two, three, and five miles while his young protege, Fred Height, mirrored his accomplishments in the amateur class. By the end of 1909, Prince would travel to Springfield, Massachusetts, home of Indian motorcycles, to build America's first circular, continuously banked motodrome in an apple orchard leased by Indian co-founder George Hendy. Indian's other co-founder, Oscar Hedstrom, would develop and refine the board track racing motorcycle and recruit the best riders in the country in the coming years. After only a year since the first motodrome was built, the first golden age of motorcycle racing began with the arrival of the American Motodrome. As he had done with his bicycle tracks, Jack Prince crisscrossed the country, erecting timber saucers in Springfield, Oakland, Atlanta, Denver, and over two dozen other cities in the United States. Having learned from his earlier oval designs, most of the motodromes were a quarter-mile circle, with banking ranging from 20 degrees to a nearly vertical 62. Grandstand bleacher seating for upwards of 10,000 were perched dangerously close to the action along the upper rim of the track. Motodromes were typically outfitted with electric arc lights, as night races were a favored spectacle, especially in the hot summer months. 
For those few daring enough to pilot their raw and untethered machines around these steeply banked and often roughly constructed board tracks, a prosperous life awaited, one full of adrenaline, accolades, and affluence. The machines quickly eliminated every comfort and convenience of the modern motorcycle. The board track racers were little more than 1,000 cc V-twins, wrapped in a short, rigid frame, with no brakes, transmission, or suspension. With the full support of the world's largest motorcycle manufacturer at the time and its racing-centric founders, those who rode for Indian motorcycles dominated the American motodrome circuit. Another iconic American manufacturer, Harley-Davidson, was notoriously opposed to the perilous motodrome circuit, refusing to participate in the sport until well after the first circular tracks were closed down. With or without Harley-Davidson, the motodrome was a sensation and the sport swelled with both enthusiastic onlookers and the most daring contestants. Still, the combination of the rough and steep tracks, along with the powerful fire-breathing machines, produced an uncommonly deadly result. Not all who entered motodrome races crossed the finish line, and dozens of young men, often teenagers and many with young families, met a gruesome fate inside these 20th century coliseums. Perhaps the most notorious of these tragedies came in the late afternoon of September 8, 1912. That day, America's star motodrome racer, William Edward Hasha, also known as the Texas Cyclone, mounted his big base eight-valve Indian for the five-mile race at the motodrome in Valesburg, New Jersey, an event that would define the sport for the next century. During the race, while running at 92 miles per hour, Hasha's Indian misfired, costing him the lead which when he attempted to make a crucial adjustment, he lost control. Hasha violently shot up the track and into the crowd, colliding with several spectators and a support post before he and his motorcycle careened back down the track and into fellow Indian rider Johnny Albright. The 20-year-old Eddie Hasha was killed instantly. Johnny Albright died in the hospital later that night. In total, 19 spectators were also sent to the hospital with injuries, but tragically, Six onlookers were also killed in the accident, the youngest of which being only 12 years old. The horror that unfurled at Valesburg would reverberate in the hearts and minds of the culture for decades. World War I hastened the inevitable end to what had been the intense and tumultuous five-year boom of the American motodrome. The inherent danger of the increasingly capable machines, frequent weather disruptions, exceedingly high costs of maintenance, and an undercurrent of distaste for the tragic gore all attributed to the motodrome's abbreviated lifespan. Though the motodrome moniker would live on in the larger wooden speedways and smaller traveling wall of death thrill shows for decades to come, the circular wooden bowls that spawned the name and captivated a nation began disappearing by 1915 and were all officially banned in 1919. Now, over a century later, Tales of the American Motodrome still captivate us. There are countless books, TV shows, and films romanticizing the perilous sport. The highly specialized machines, often called board track racers, have become some of the most coveted and valuable of all time. The stories have become lore, American mythology, and the men who dared to risk it all on the banked timber wall remain icons of a culture.